Welcome everyone to another episode of As Told by Nomads. And today I have an expert in transformative leadership. He goes by the name of Jason Scott. We're going to be talking about how we need to make sure that teams are winning, right? And how to understand the transformative power of actually getting things done. So his career has navigated a span of life life experiences he's been jumping out of helicopters he's uh rescued people as, as a swimmer and he's also worked with a range of companies from a variety of different backgrounds and he's also navigating this location independence world that we are continuing to move into welcome to the show jason i'm super excited to be here tayo um i yeah i'm ready to do it let's do it <laughs> Well, no, I, I, one of the things that I, I always love to do is just to get to know the person. So with you growing up, what was the first career that you wanted to have? Wow. You know, I've never been asked that question before. Um, I So I, I grew up in gangland Los Angeles, and I, I really didn't think about, I didn't have dreams. I really didn't. Like I, I didn't fit in with the kids. I didn't do great in school. Uh, as it turns out, it wasn't because I wasn't smart or capable. I just was disinterested. Um, and so, I mean, the first thing that I really wanted to do was get away. And so the, the, as soon as I finished high school, in fact, I didn't even finish high school. As soon as I was of legal age, 17 years old, I joined the Navy. Yeah. And so it was, it was once I joined the Navy that I started contemplating the possibilities simply because the coolest thing about joining the military, not that I'm advocating this because it is dangerous, but the coolest thing about joining the military is they will let you volunteer to do anything that you are willing to do. And I was right. like a sponge. So I volunteered to do absolutely everything. And the things that I learned then opened up possibilities to me. And that, that probably was my first lesson in curiosity. Like curiosity has, has basically been what's led my, my entire life and all of my eventual successes. <laughs> well, okay. So, you know, I can't let this slip by. You said growing up in gangland, Los Angeles. So for, for context, and I'm sure you're going to provide even more, obviously the parts of Los Angeles that have been a hotbed for, for different gang activities, whether it's Crips, Bloods, or different types of gangs. What was that like for you? So the, I lived in a, a part of Los Angeles where, where the gangs were Latin gangs. And the reason that I lived in that neighborhood is because my parents got divorced. Uh, my mom was, didn't have a career. She was like a stay at home mom. So she took whatever job she could take uh, and she wasn't making very much money. So she moved us into a neighborhood where at the age of five, I saw my first murder. I then was walking to kindergarten, which was two blocks away on the way to school. I got jumped at recess. I got jumped at lunch. I started swinging my lunchbox around to prevent myself from getting beat up. Uh, and then I ran all the way home, which is where I first learned that I was a fast runner. I don't look like I'm built for speed, but I, I used to be a really fast runner. Yeah. And I just remember being like, six years old thinking, wow, I've seen this on TV, but I didn't think these, this, this fighting started so early. I didn't really understand the social dynamic that I was in until much later. Yeah. Um, but I, I will honestly say it gives me, it gives me perspective on discrimination that I, I, there's no way I would otherwise have. Yeah. 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 You know, one of the things I always say about worldview, because I, I like to think in frameworks, you know, you, you know, as a professor, I always put things into the equations. And so I say worldview is lived experience plus exposure. And if you want to improve or understand your worldview, reflecting your lived experience and what you've been exposed to, you've had quite the lived experience, but you've been exposed to something and your exposure to something gave you a lens into discrimination that maybe if you didn't have that lived experience in addition to exposure, you wouldn't have understood the impact of what you're I saying. I couldn't. I yeah. couldn't have. I couldn't have the empathy that I have for, you know, the discrimination and the racial inequality that I have if I yeah. hadn't, if I hadn't experienced this. And this is, I have, through my life, the lived experiences, I have literally watched each of those change my perspective 100%. on life. So I'm a, I'm a huge advocate. Like there's opinion, there's interacting, there's learning from others, but there's absolutely nothing like the change in perspective that is possible by putting yourself out there, being yeah. curious. It, allowing the, allowing yourself to have uncomfortable experiences will probably lead to more growth than anything within your comfort zone. 
anything, right? Even with working out, it's one of my favorite examples. When you work out, you, you get uncomfortable because you can't get past a certain rep, but you know that your muscles are working. And then eventually the next day or next week, or maybe two weeks later, you push past that plateau and they like, it, it's pain, but it, it, it's part of that, right? You basically practice failure every time you're working out because you get to a point where you can't go and then you have to push through that. And so you, with you practicing uh, ideas of perceived failure, you navigate this idea that Navy was this, and then you became a sponge and you were a sponge while you were swimming <laughs> and rescuing people. Why was that the path you chose in the Navy to decide to, to be a rescue swimmer? Oh, that, that the honest answer is because it was cool, <laughs> right? Like it was cool. Like I, so I, I, I went in the, the, when you join the military, they give you an aptitude test just to kind of see like what types of jobs you might like be, be good at, feel comfortable in. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, you can't, you can't resign, you can't quit. So it, they want to make sure that they, they've aligned you with what might look like success. Yes. Um, and so I, I took a test and I could have basically any job that I wanted. And at the time, don't laugh, man, this, this, this age, is just, I was like, computers are the future. So yeah. I took a job in data processing. So, and that job required me to give five years initially instead of four, because, uh, you know, it was considered advanced training. So a lot of the things that I learned how to do, I wouldn't have otherwise been able to do because I was in, you know, let's call it this white collar job, uh, but you could volunteer for anything and, and becoming a rescue swimmer wasn't necessarily a path that I chose or was even available to me, except for there was a problem where the administrators transferred the two rescue swimmers off the ship and a ship can't leave the dock without two rescue swimmers. And so the, the people in, um, in the deck department, which are the people that usually would go to swimmer school, they sent two, they washed out, they sent two, they washed out. And so here we are, I've got a skipper who wants to make Admiral, but his boat can't leave the dock. This is a problem. Mm -hmm. So he opens up, he opens up um, tryouts to the whole ship. And I was like, I was a, I did, I, I was a, I was a swimmer on swim teams growing up. I was like, I could do this. So I, I, I ran and I swam and I did push-ups and I did sit-ups and I did more than anybody else. So they sent me to rescue swimmer school. <laughs> uh, I, and you know, I'm obsessed with Top Gun at the time, right? Like the Navy SEALs are super cool. Come on, so, yeah. So, and rescue swimmer school had the second highest attrition rate to the Navy SEALs training. So I was like, let me go see if I could do this. I still will never forget the feeling of graduating and being surprised. Like I got through this brutal training where every day their job is to see if they can get you to quit. Cause that's really what a lot of this, this, the, these elite sports are about success is that you're just willing to push through whatever your brain is telling you and not give up. Right. The same yeah. with special forces. Like if you jump out of a helicopter into the water and there's 10 people in the water, your job is to swim as fast as you can for as long as you can. And the sea takes the rest. Yeah. Right. And they want to make sure that you're going to do that. Yeah. And so I, I remember graduating and just, <laughs> thinking I cannot believe that I made it through rescue swimmer school. I didn't even join thinking I could make it. I just yeah. joined because it was cool. And then I never gave up. And yeah, you are, you, you know, you brought up Top Gun. Uh, I don't know if you've seen Top Gun Maverick. Uh, yeah. No, but I hear it's, I hear it's, oh. I, I hear it's phenomenal. What, my, my, my most fun experience is seen in movies this year, that and everything, every all at once, but it's so much better than even Top Gun. And so, uh, and the reason I, I want to bring that there is because obviously you've learned a lot about leadership and teamwork. If anyone has watched Top Gun, there, there was that idea of figuring out a work as a team or people would die, right? You know, whether it's, yeah. you know, Iceman or, you know, Goose or, or figuring out, you know, what Maverick is going to do and all these things. You had to figure out how to work as a team. And that is so germane to anyone in the military. The team leadership. What did you learn about both concepts when you were there? So I, you, I have a sad answer. Yeah, I didn't, mm. um, because there there are groups in the military that need to work as a team, like special forces teams, and do work as a team, and where their leaders do employ what I consider real leadership, and I'll mm. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and, and clearly these fighter pilots need to operate as a team. And that was the big lesson for Maverick is that leadership isn't about Maverick. Leadership is playing for the rest of the team. And then when yeah. they're successful, Maverick as the leader is successful. And this is really the servant leadership model. So growing up in, gang in gangland Los Ange Angeles, having a father that was in the military and the vast majority of military is commanding control. I tell 
you do. They're not looking for people to be thought leaders in the lower ranks. They do need people to think in the special forces as fighter pilots, et cetera. So again, they're employing a different model. So I, I learned this command and control in the Navy. I then go and get my first job and then I get my first team and I'm terrible because I'm employing this I tell, you do, I don't even want to call it leadership. I'm employing this, this form of I tell, you do management um, and it was because I was the smartest person in the room and it was all about me and I wanted them to work hard so I could be successful, except for what I realized over time is this model is not very motivating to anybody within it. And if you have somebody that wants to think, somebody that potentially wants to motivate, that wants to make an impact, they're going to leave. So teams under this model are not that high functioning. Yeah. So somewhere along the way, I had multiple real human interactions with people where, where I worked with them to co-create their roadmap to a shared goal it felt better it got better results they were motivated um i i was introduced to servant leadership and that's when i realized that leadership isn't about me it's about the team when you decide to be a leader you put yourself aside and your job is to ensure that your team defines and delivers the necessary and expected results and when they win you're winning and so I'm a leader in service of my team. Not only does this feel better, but the team gets better results because I'm what I'm basically doing is in this helping them architect their own roadmap to a shared goal, I'm cultivating the collective IQ. Yeah. The solutions are smarter. People are bought into the solutions. This is where innovation is possible. Yeah. So sadly, my experience, I had a great experience in the Navy. Don't get me wrong, but my experience of leadership wasn't, it, it was really command and control, I tell you do. Yeah. And so it was really how not to be a thought leader yeah. where people can quit their jobs, where innovation is necessary, where where people want to thrive, right? The military is a little bit about do your time. I found a way to like make that time awesome, but I, I don't feel like that's everyone's experience. Well, what you explain is what you've talked about so often. You talk about the difference between authority and a leader. It sounds like that's what you have to you know, distinguish between and decipher there. Sure. And don't get me wrong. There's a place for command and control. Right. Like if, if we happen to be somewhere, you and I, where things started blowing up, I, I probably wouldn't even say to you, get under the table. I would probably grab you and throw you under the table as I'm flipping tables, screaming at other people to get down. I wouldn't think about it. I would just react. My training yeah. would kick in. And I, in the end, I wouldn't be like, hey, man, I'm so sorry I threw you on the ground. I mean, I probably would. Yeah. Because I, <laughs> I would be sorry I threw you on the ground, but I wouldn't feel like I did anything wrong. Yeah, because it's, you know, it's life and death, right? <laughs> you're thinking. Right. Yeah. And now uh, it's funny. I realize saying that you're probably this this tall, super tall, huge guy that I wouldn't be able to effectively. No, it's okay. You know, I, I, I'm just, no, I, I'm six ones. So I don't know, <laughs> but but you know what happens? Adrenaline will probably drive you, and you throw me off, and I'll be like, yeah. So <laughs> it it works out. I, okay, but no, that makes sense because I, I really want to distinguish that. I went to boarding school. I'm from Nigeria, and um, we had a lot of that type of um. It was it's just, it's, it, for lack of a better word, militaristic type of things. You know. Even when I was, was younger, you, you know, people could actually hit kids it, until it only yeah, shifted. Teachers could do that. And so it was all based on what the law was. And it, even if the person was wrong. And I remember growing up, I had uh, multiple of experience growing up in five countries, four continents. And I remember the first time I started. Wow. Yeah. I remember the first time I started challenging authority and it was like, whoa, I said it. Why are you calling, calling it back? And my mom and I joke about this. But it was one of those things that I had to unlearn because growing up, I always thought whatever anyone in that is that is an older person says is law. That was just what I, I, I was growing to I grew to accept. And then I started challenging it and it was very uncomfortable because I was the only one doing it, right? People, this guy's rude. What are you doing? How dare you? What are you talking about? You're, you know, you're letting what you've learned in the world, uh, you know, take away from, from culture. And I think many people are at odds with that right now because they deal with that internal dialogue of, wait, I'm the only one saying this, is it worth it? Or should I be doing this? I feel like no one else is on board with me or I'll be like the bad person if I challenge something that I know is true. Because here's, that, the, that. here's the real answer. You're the one that's brave enough to stand up and do the right thing. You're speaking for everyone. Human beings don't like to be 
told that they have to do something. Mm. I, I speak I speak in front of large audiences on the regular and I've got a couple of typical questions and often I'll ask an audience like how, what emotion the word mandatory evokes. And I just ask them to blurt out like a one word emotion and it's always negative, right? Like we might do the thing that's mandatory, but our first instinct is to not to want to do it. And we, we really see this in the way that we handled the, the, the automobile death uh, situation in the 70s yeah. and COVID recently, meaning yes. in the 70s, it was actually handled as a public health issue and it was really effective. Like I get in the car these days and I don't feel safe without putting a seatbelt on. Uh, I'm sure you didn't grow up with seatbelts either, knowing that you lived across five continents. Yeah, right? yeah. It was, you, so, know, they, you made that rule, right? But you know, right, then so they wild. make the rule. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead. No, it's I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's so wild that people didn't drive with seatbelts before. We didn't think it was anything. <laughs> There wasn't seatbelts at first, right? So so there's this situation where we realize as a country that a lot of people are dying in automobile deaths. And the first reaction wasn't, let's take away cars, because that's absurd. And the first reaction wasn't tell people that wearing a seatbelt was mandatory. They actually gave us a choice. It didn't look or feel necessarily like a choice, but it definitely felt different than mandatory. Meaning, if you didn't want to wear a seatbelt, you would get a ticket. Mm. So you have a choice, right? If you don't, or here's the thing. Or maybe you could just get away with it. But over time, but they didn't just stop there, right? They incented automobile manufacturers to put the seatbelts in. They ran educational campaign campaigns. They got in our head to the point where now I get in the car and I realize I don't have my seatbelt on. Or, I'm, or if, if I'm driving out of the driveway and I haven't gotten to it yet because I'm in a hurry, my kids will be like, Dad, put your seatbelt on. Mm-hmm. Like they're super bought in. Like it is just not safe. I remember when I first started riding a motorcycle, mm-hmm. auto, helmets, Helmets were not necessary. I mean, they were not mandatory. That you didn't, you weren't legally required to wear a helmet. And let's face it, if you get caught not wearing a helmet in states where this is the law, they don't put you in jail. You yeah. just get a ticket. So it still is a choice. And now today, I. <laughs> One of the things that Next Jump Outfitters sells are these scooters that go 40 miles an hour. They're so fast, like like the Lime scooters, right? Um, mm-hmm. I don't feel comfortable riding 40 miles an hour on a little scooter without a helmet on, right? Like yeah, it, yeah. they got in my right. head. They so did. they didn't make it mandatory and they educated us. Whereas with COVID, they said masks are mandatory. And then otherwise educated, rational human beings, like people that prior to COVID, I was like, you are a super rational human being. <laughs> After, not so much. Like COVID's not real, so, so they didn't have to wear a mask, right? COVID's not real, so they didn't have to get the vaccine, right? They told themselves all these stories, and I think it's really because the government said this is mandatory and we are taking away your choice, ah. right? So h- human beings, when given choice, meaning, hey, like, if I were to come to you and say, I, I think we should I think we should go on the mission. I think you're this you're the right guy for it. And you say back to me, Jay, I am I am the right guy for this. And then I describe what I think only you can do. And then I, I ask you, okay, how will you do that? Because I want to make sure that we're aligned and we get on the same page. And so you start walking me through how you would accomplish that. And you know, let's say I hear something and I think I don't I don't understand how that's gonna help him accomplish his goal. So I say, Well, let's talk a little bit more about that. I must be missing something. I don't I don't see it hitting. And eventually you land on something where I'm like, Okay, cool, I get it. You came up with how to get there. You had choice. You're totally bought in. You did all the critical thinking. You're probably gonna be excited about it because I asked you, dude, is this your thing? You're like, it's totally my thing. Huh. I'm going to, I'm going to get a better result than if I come to you and say, Tayo, like this, this, this is mandatory, man. You, you got to so do it. You're so interested. Sorry. Another thing that I, one of the reasons I can relate to this, I grew up under dictatorships initially for the first decade of my life. Right. And w- when I was seeing the COVID thing, maybe it's because I have a different experience. I was like, you know, come on, like, let's do this for each other. And Nigeria is very collectivist, right? It's not individualist. And I think there are pros and cons to both sides, right? Individualism and collectivism. But to your point, I saw a lot of people translating that as a lack of choice. But then I would also see the same people not use the same argument for other things that wh- whatever side you're on, the political party would say, well, you're, this is my, my body, my right, and all these things. And I, I would like, how are you not able to look at the same the same instance here, well, but use one, you know, this is what I'm saying, right? So let's call this out. I think it's important, let's be clear. This, the group of people, we won't name them, but everybody knows who they are, <laughs> that refuse to wear masks as an infringement on their rights is the yeah. same group of people that is saying women do not have a right to do with Bam. their body what they want to do with their body. Yeah. And here's the deal. 
they, I promise you, it is not hypocrisy. They're not connecting these two things as equal. So that's what you, okay. So, so you know, help me, in, because it, it's hard for me to see, I'm obviously in diversity, equity, inclusion. So I'm in fields of people that disagree with me, right? And I have these conversations all the time. And even if you bring it up, let's say it, to your point, it's not something that they see as equal. It's a false equivalence to them, even though that's what both sides are arguing. How <laughs> is, <laughs> you know, how do you think they got there? Is it because they just don't like being told what to do? So there's a couple of things at play. Sadly, our worst behavior is nature. Mm. Our human, the, our humans' worst behaviors are nature, not nurture. Oh. Now, these are the same behaviors that have kept us alive in a world where we are not the fastest, the strongest, not even the smartest or meanest of creatures. So let's start with fear. Human beings chase pleasure and retreat from pain. People, we are not wired to want to have uncomfortable yes, I discussions. I agree. We are not wired to want to put ourselves in uncomfortable situations. And then we layer on top of that our confirmation bias, which allows us to be efficient. We hang out with people that think like us and are like us because then they'll protect us. They don't necessarily want to protect the weirdo that's saying things that they don't get along with, right? Because that person doesn't believe what we believe. So that person is untrustworthy. So back when we lived in, in teepees and in caves, Right? Like if you and I believe the same thing, there's a high degree of likelihood that if somebody comes into the campground at night while I'm sleeping, you're going to protect me or you're going to wake me. Yeah. Right? Whereas, you know, if you're not like me, you don't think like me, can I trust you? We're wired to wired. push back on things that, that, that conflict with our pre existing notions. In fact, there's four chemicals produced by the human brain that make us feel happy. That would be dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and then endorphins, which is an athlete you're super yeah, familiar with. Yeah, yeah. When, when we exercise our confirmation bias, which is just, it's a muscle, it just reacts, our brain rewards us with a shot of dopamine. So when we push back on an idea that com contradicts a previously held belief, our brain goes, ah, that's right yeah and gives us a little dopamine yeah. and so this is this is why when you take situations that are scary where people are willing to tell themselves any kind of story to make it okay and again this is relative to the blame mechanism yeah brene brown brene brown says yes. that blame is the discharging of discomfort and pain yes she does. because we retreat we retreat from pain and seek pleasure but it has an inverse relationship with accountability and so to be great leaders we have to be open to new ideas, to be learners and growers, we have to be open to ideas that make us feel uncomfortable because we're not gonna prevent the confirmation bias from no. being triggered, but we can transcend it. Victor Frankl said that in the space between stimulus and response, we have choice. So yeah. with, with that said, you hear me expressing a great deal of empathy for all these polarized camps. Yeah. And this is what I wish every leader would do. Stop throwing hate, empathize, have a conversation, work to understand. You might never agree fully, but your universe, your worldview will be broadened. It'll allow us to come together as humans. Because look, all we want is humans to be successful in our relationships, with our families, and in our jobs. And we can only really do that through positive community. Yeah. You know, as humans, we want to be seen, heard, and understood for who we really are. And a lot of us have attached meanings, religion, whatever you believe, like a belief system, to what it means for you to belong. And when you see a perceived threat, whether it's real or not, it really triggers a lot of the responses you're saying, right? Th th those four things. And, and so it's, it's interesting. Uh, so I, I love that breakdown, and I, and, I, and I know that the audience will as well. Uh, but you've been talking about human behavior here. And this takes me back to a film, one of the greatest films of all time, The Godfather, right? So my, <laughs> my, Michael Corleone says, it's not personal, it's strictly business. And so what do you say when you hear that? Because I feel like you have a, an interesting response to someone that says, yeah, it's not personal, it's strictly business. What, what do you think about that? Okay, so huge fan of The Godfather, right? Like, so I'm not contradicting The Godfather, but I am saying I did write a book in response yes, to Michael you Corleone's <laughs> statement. And the book's titled, It's Never Just Business, It's About People. Yeah. And and this definitely ties in to what we're talking about because I, you know, I've I've grown up hearing people say, This company's bad. 
this company's good. The government's bad. The government's good. The government's lying to us. There's no such thing as this company or that company or the government. Like a company is basically a legal entity that if nobody ever goes to work there is nothing. It accomplishes nothing. It's like an idea. A company really is made up of all of the humans that go there and potentially rally around the vision of the purpose of this company to otherwise create value. The government is the same. When people come to me with these comp conspiracy theories, government conspiracy theories, I'm like, you, <laughs> you think they're all on the same. You, so in order to keep this a secret, all of the humans in the government would have to agree not to say anything about this. Now, to some degree, I think this is possible in like where, where they're only letting people that have been screened and have top secret clearances, but they're not talking about that government. They're talking about the people in the Social Security Administration. They're talking about people in the DMV. They're talking about like the government, like everybody that carries like, like a government badge. And I'm just like, it's, these are people not capable of keeping the secrets that you are in, in like that you are implying that they are keeping right and so yeah. what we have to understand as leaders if if we look at our organizations of people that's why it's called an organization and we are happy with the results that we're getting it's because of the way that the people are doing their jobs if we feel like our organization needs to get different results no amount of technology is going to change the results our people have to do their jobs differently and that that can be supported by the implementation of technology and so the idea is we need people to be excited about doing their jobs differently or they won't so you can go in there all command and control but check it out every single person we know has been told that they had to do something that that they were that they were otherwise getting paid to do aka their job that they refused to do probably silently Right. Like, you, yeah, and I, yeah. I, I was just in a meeting yesterday where somebody was like, I was talking about where we weren't getting the results that I think we need. And one of my younger team members was like, as I'm talking empathetically about it, she was like, well, isn't this just their job? And I was like, I mean, we could approach it like that, but I don't think we're going to get good results. Like, right. uh, when think about the last time, you know, one of us asked you to do something. Oh God, I just said her name. Uh, one of us asked you to do something and you just didn't want to do it so you didn't get around to it and because you have 800 other priorities right you like prioritized i was like or we could we could recognize that we haven't we haven't what we think we need to do is it resonating with our team members so we should ask them like what's the obstacle how does this resonate get give them choice get them involved in the solution yeah gallup gallup performed a study and found that human beings in the workplace once once they make enough money to take money off the table like most of us feel like we can make more money but like once we make enough money to take money off the table we're motivated by mastery autonomy and purpose and i prove this again when i talk to big audiences because there's always the skeptic that's like no it's money i ask them raise your hand if you've been paid to have your time wasted in a meeting everybody in the audience raises their hand and i say keep them up and then i say lower your hand if you were not frustrated by having your time wasted in the meeting that you you were paid to be at nobody lowers their hands yeah. that proves that it's not money people not there's no money enough money in the world to make people feel good about having their time wasted no no this is so brilliant by the way so please continue to plug your book where can they get your book oh uh amazon I mean, Amazon. where can you get any book, right? The, yeah, the fastest way to get any book is amazon.com. We'll make sure I'll put that in the show notes. And, and, and I love that that you're talking about that because I, I think it's, to your point, a lot of people forget that people make up systems. And the reason those conspiracy theories that you've been talking about can sometimes be hard to believe, in my opinion, I agree with you, by the way, but I, I meet people who have were so convinced. It's because of what you said earlier. You were talking about how we are so committed to our camps the amount of organization it would take for everyone to be on the same page and not just the elite of the elite in terms of government clearance, but the people at the DMV, like you said, and the social security office and all those people, they would have to actually agree on everything, including politics, including religion, <laughs> including whatever, and decide it's a secret that they're keeping together. And That's these are right. people that make up a lot of things. There's no way there would be no leak, right? It would be like, It'll come out at some point. <laughs> right, right. I, and I always ask, like, not everybody works in a really big company or works in the really big government, right? So I ask people that work in smaller companies, 
30 people companies, right? 25 people companies. When was the last time everybody agreed on an idea in your 25 person company? And they're basically like, never, 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 never. Yeah, no, no. But, but one thing that you, you do want people to do, because people can't agree on this, but this is something you believe everyone should agree on. It's the idea of communicating your accomplishments daily. I saw this and I love it, but why, why, why should we communicate our accomplishments daily? And is there a framework we can use to do that? All right. So this is, this is a highly controversial tool, even at 120VC where we, we use this on the regular. And we have some clients that adopt it, that get it, and others that don't. And I always tell people, like, if something in your mind is saying this won't work, it won't. Because you're not seeing what I'm seeing. So don't even try it if you don't think it's going to work. But there, <laughs> there's some science behind this. One we are taught, at least in the US culture, that in order to be happy, we have to accomplish something. So we set goals. But then what happens is we we meet the goal and we just move the goalpost. Sean Acor talks about this um, in his book, The, the Happiness Advantage. And yeah. so we, we have a tendency to be goalpost movers. And so me, typical goalpost mover, when throughout my career, there was many times, like even at what have been considered the height, like when I was, according to society, the most successful, I didn't feel successful because I was always moving the goalpost. And so people would ask me to share an accomplishment and I rarely could share an accomplishment because there was nothing that I had accomplished in my own eyes that was big enough to feel accomplished. And the truth is I wasn't happy. Mm. No matter how successful society perceived me, I was, I was unhappy. The other thing that we do is we help organizations at, at multiple stages achieve the outcomes that they think that they need. This requires discipline and intentionality. The second I say discipline, most people go, ew, he used the D word, right? It, it, because discipline often means complexity and the vast majority of human beings retreat from complexity. It shuts their brains down. And so the daily status report is a really simple way to at the end of the day, reflect on your accomplishments, and this word is very intentional, accomplishments. What did you actually get done that moved the needle for whatever it is that you're responsible for? It's not gonna be 10 things. Some days it's not gonna be one thing. Okay, but if it wasn't one whole thing to completion, did you accomplish something that moved a piece of something forward? Like one accomplishment. Mm. Scanning the world for what you've accomplished, when you realize you've accomplished something, cause your brain to produce dopamine, the reward for getting things done. Yeah. So one accomplishment, dopamine. Then you think, oh my gosh, another accomplishment. You write it down, dopamine. And so you get in the habit of you get in the habit of paying attention to what you've actually accomplished. Because again, fundamentally human beings want to be successful in their relationships, in their lives, at their jobs, right? So taking a minute to just reflect on have I been successful is incredibly valuable in 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 our in being happy in feeling successful, in feeling good about ourselves, in having great self-esteem, in developing confidence. Mm. What have you accomplished? The, the next thing that we have people do is think, okay, what do I need to do tomorrow? What do I need to accomplish tomorrow? So again, maybe it's one thing, maybe it's two things, maybe it's three things. This whole exercise maybe takes five or 10 minutes once you get started at the end of the day. The other thing that we do, and it's actually first, so what we do is we list three gratitudes. And then again, I've got to thank Sean Acor twice because this I got from his book. We, we, we think of three things, real things, tangible things that actually happened that we're grateful for. Then we think, what did we accomplish? And then what do we need to accomplish tomorrow? The gratitudes actually produce dopamine and make us feel good. So it's the end of the day, you're otherwise tired. Your accomplishments produce dopamine. And then the last thing um, is listing what you need to accomplish tomorrow closes those loops. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night like, oh my God, I don't wanna forget to do this thing. And, and if you're a rookie, you don't roll over and write it down and you try to go back to sleep and you can't go back to sleep. But if you roll over and write it down, you've closed that loop. Yeah. And you can go back to sleep. So yeah. like, I don't wake up in the middle of the night very often thinking, gosh, I don't want to forget something because I've planned the three or four things that I need to do to move the needle tomorrow. And it's the same thing at the end of the week. I think, okay, what do I have to do Monday? And I send the email out to my team so they know. And I've closed all my loops. I can mm -hmm. enjoy my weekend because I know exactly what I need to be doing on Monday. The other thing that's amazing is we were doing this daily status report thing to be aligned, right? To be a high functioning team. And we were just listing accomplishments and planned accomplishments. They, 
the DSRs, our daily status reports, were less popular. And again, like I said, these are small little things, baby steps of discipline, baby steps in planning out your next day. It's not like a huge thing. It's not complex. It's like one thing, maybe three things, four things. When we added the gratitudes, everybody started reading them. Meaning, I'm you work at 120 and you have nothing to do with uh, Jake's team. You're not on Jake's team. You don't work with Jake's team, but Jake's team is sending out their DSRs to everybody. We send them out yeah. to like a group and Jake goes through and he reads his team members, but team members from other teams started reading other people's daily status reports because of the gratitudes. Why? Because when you read somebody else's gratitude, we have this mirror neuron in our brain that causes yes. our brains to produce dopamine. And so we got aligned. It helped create community. Um, so there's a, there's like, I could go on. There's a no, I love it. reasons to celebrate and communicate your accomplishments every day. Mm -hmm. Team alignment. You want to be a high functioning team. I, it takes me 10 minutes every morning to read my team members, what they accomplished yesterday and what they're planning on accomplishing. And it allows me to like, Hey, great. Like I read it. I'm great. They're killing it. Or I'll read that they're going to do something where I had had a conversation with an executive in one of our, our, our clients. And they, based on what they said they were going to do, they, they didn't have that information. So I reply, they have the information. They're more effective. We don't have to have huge meetings every day. They're, they have a ton of autonomy. And it's just because we take a couple of minutes at the end of every day yeah. to think through what, we're, what we've done, what we're going to do next, and yeah. communicate with each other. Yeah. And so I'll, I will leave you on this topic with this. At 120 VC, we believe that we communicate to lead. And so that's what that allows us to do. We're all showing up as leaders for each other. I love this so much. You know, ironically, I started doing a similar exercise with my my friends and followers, and it's really it, it's such an interesting thing. And I, I guess I can see how it could be controversial, but it's that stop, rewind, reset, reflect, uh, because I believe we live in a world that's too reactive instead of reflective. And so a lot of people just realize to understand and appreciate the journey as opposed to the destination. The destination often doesn't come with the expectations that we've attached to it, but when we learn to love the process of, of the journey, there's a beautiful internal uh, feeling of joy that, that, can, that can be used to offset whatever that external uh, thing that we need you know, when we think we're supposed to be happy. And, and so I, I, I love that you do it. That's, that's all I can say. I think it's such a great, <laughs> it's a great tool. Uh, hopefully others uh, come to accept it though. Uh, that, would, that would be the goal in terms of that. Right. And I mean, I love the, the model that you just described it actually sounds a lot sexier Oh. Daily status report, but it it really it, I think it sounds like it accomplishes the same. No, thing. it's the same thing. No, that's why I was nodding throughout what you were saying. I because I, I I do it, you know. And the reason I do it with friends and followers is because I'm I don't know if you agree. It sounds like you you agree with this. I I, I don't believe in having superficial friends, right? I believe oh, yeah. in having yeah people that add value to life, and you add you challenge them as much as they challenge you. And I I, I want to be able to be that type of person that lives that way professionally or personally. And so that's why I love it. And I think it's so cool uh, because that's the only way teams can be humanized in their full form. Right. You're not, you're not drifting through life being reactive. Yes. You're being intentional and, and creating, or at least living the deep meaning, yes. living yeah. the depth of it, as opposed yeah. to just sort of transitioning over the surface of it. Well, you run a team of deep thinkers. So tell us more about 120 VC, your company. Uh, so what 120 VC is in the business of enabling our customers to achieve the transformative power of getting stuff done or the rated R version is getting shit done. Shit done, getting shit done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's not cliche. Like 22 years ago, when I started the company, we, 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 we were, we were in the project management business. Very quickly, I realized that executives are less interested in a single project than they are about ensuring that all of their projects get done each year for the amount of money set aside because projects are really changes that they feel they need to see in their organization to accomplish future goals. Um, Agile hit the scene. I thought that was great. It was like clearly a model for servant leadership. Scrum, which was intended to be a better way of developing software. We, we And so th at the time, everybody was like, oh, you don't need project management anymore. I was like, nah but I wasn't really allowed to say it without sounding old and dusty. So I kind of, we kept doing that. 
and we got into the agile and the scrum stuff and and then we we ended up in getting into organizational change leadership demand management somewhere along the way i realized that leadership in and of itself is a change discipline nobody hires a leader anymore because they want their organization to be the same in a month six months or a year um and then as i developed my own personal habits through education with the Stegan leadership academy uh just reading books trying to be the best possible leader of my own business um, I realized that I had to also have like an operational management mm -hmm. strategy or approach to be very intentional about the things that I, I was delivering. And so um, one of the things that I think is cool about 120VC is we don't experiment on our clients. We don't build anything that is bespoke, uh, which is a really fancy word for we'll create something custom that is unproven uh, that will cost you a lot of money. Uh, we have models that we use over and over and refine over time. And so for each of the discipline that I just named, we have crafts developed, we have education, we have books, as you know. Um, and so we really ended up over the course of the last 22 years being in the business of working with anybody that leads a team to apply the appropriate craft for the necessary outcomes and help them get the outcomes that they feel like they need within the constraints of time and money that they have. So gotcha. we really are in the business of enabling people to get shit done. All right. Well, we'll make sure I'll put that in the show notes uh, and make sure that people can, uh, you know, get to work with you because it sounds like it's going to be a great experience. So, uh, and, and by the way, I really want to thank you for being so vulnerable and open about this because I, I, I think it's so important for people to realize that leaders can actually be like this. You know, you don't have to, you know, be robotic, if you will. So, yeah, yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it? I, I, I feel like it's. This is another one of my platforms. This whole notion of being professional. He, oh, I, I feel like I hate it. Right. Like it, it seems to me like they're saying we have to act perfect, be emotionless, and and act like robots. This isn't possible. Again, it's never just businesses about people. Like people aren't aren't perfect. People are emotional beings. All of our decisions are made from our feeling brain that has no capacity for speech. The limbic system, right? Like, so I I think that that really gets in the way of. This is probably one of the biggest things that gets in the way of organizations achieving the outcomes that they think they need. Is 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 discouraging people from being authentic. Yes. Encouraging people to pretend that they are emotionless robots because here's what happens. Since that's not possible, people are actually getting paid to invest time in looking good. Yeah. As instead opposed of, to getting stuff done. Good. But by the right. way, yeah, instead of being good, you have to I look, love that. Yeah, instead of being good, you have to get or we have to look like your version of authenticity as opposed to their version of authenticity. This is one of my most controversial things. Maybe many people don't agree with me on this, but I, you know, when I teach students or when I'm working with clients, I'm always like, you know, be yourself. And they're like, what does that mean? I'm like, your hair or your talk. It, I don't, it doesn't bother me. But um, many people disagree with me on this. So I'm glad that you agree. <laughs> I am uh, so in your camp. Like, can you imagine a world where people were encouraged to be authentic? And, and here's why that would be powerful because it takes both sides to encourage that. Like if I'm encouraging you and everybody else I meet to be authentic, that means that I am super good with you being authentic, right? What would, I mean, I think we, we would all be able to talk to each other. I think we'd all be able to listen well, to sure. each other. And it might, it might just start with the simplest of, let's just all encourage each other to be authentic. Yeah, oh my gosh. You know, I could talk I to you I think that day. there's a lot of destructive trends out there. Sorry, and I'll stop. No, no, no. I think no, there's no. a Go lot ahead. of, there, there's a lot of destructive movements out there today in response to people being discouraged to be authentic. I think they're like, oh, you don't want me to be authentic? I'll show you. Again, yeah. very similar to, I got to wear a mask. I'll yeah. show you. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's all that it's the cycle. And that's the way we have reacted as a world to throughout history, you know? And so uh, but actually leads me to my final question. Uh, you've listened to podcasts. I always ask the guests this question. My mission statement is use your difference to make a difference. And the reason I came up with that um, is because I feel like throughout history, we, we, we've stripped away people's differences or we've politicized it or we've made a, a role to eliminate it if it's different from us, right? And so I'm encouraging people to use their difference, identify it and use it to make an impact. So I love how it. do you, thank you. How do you, Jason, use your difference to make a difference? I'm, I'm pausing because I, I, I have an answer, but I want to give you a thoughtful answer. No, please. I, I 
and this is something I did not realize about myself. If, like for your listeners, if they go back to the beginning of this podcast, like as a child, I didn't have dreams and I was unintentional. Um, and as I, I left and I went out and started interacting with the world, I remember people would make comments. And I remember uh, a woman named Lori, this is, I was very young. I was out of the Navy and she looked at me and she said, I want to be around more people like you. And I didn't, I, I didn't say it. I didn't have the courage to say it, but I didn't know what she was talking about. <laughs> and, and so over time, I realized that for some reason, the way that I approach the world gets people excited. Like I, I have a knack for people to get, I have a knack for getting people excited for otherwise boring stuff like project management daily status reports like really boring stuff and so my my purpose my leadership purpose is to inspire or my difference this thing that i'm bringing to the world yeah my purpose is to inspire people to reach for their potential not my potential not what society thinks their potential is but their potential and i feel like this is very aligned with what you just said use your difference to make a difference i mean that's what you're doing you're putting yourself right. out there, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, what? So, what's what's your difference? So, I, to make I, a difference. So, when when I always I, when I get asked this question is I I always say I try to ensure that people feel safe enough to be themselves, and it's and, and the reason I and it's just as simple as that. And the reason I say safe enough to be themselves is because it's not been safe for many people from different backgrounds to be who they truly are. And my goal is to dismantle any system of oppression and suppression in any system. So for me, doing it myself and creating a platform with that is, is how I do that. So, yeah. Right on. I have, I have a question for you, if you don't Please. mind. This will be my last question. If you could give somebody a silver bullet for doing that, for encouraging everyone around them to be authentic, for hearing other people's ideas, ideas for dismantling any mechanism of of suppression or repression like what what would the with a silver bullet be you know i really think vulnerability is an underrated skill set and i think if i could tell leaders to do something i think they would be you would be vulnerable enough to talk about what you learn unlearn and relearn i think that's the cycle of life and you have to make it a practice as a company and as an individual as a company we thought this would work it didn't work this is what i think now when I first started this company, I used to think like this. This is now, if anyone feels opposite of this way, please feel safe enough to do that. And we don't talk about a lot of what we unlearn because many of us have a culture of making what we learn just tradition. And we don't talk about how we, we can strip the toxic elements of that tradition into something. And when we don't navigate that unlearning cycle and make it public, a lot of people feel like they just have to stick with whatever they, what they were taught in school. And then we don't even practice relearning. So I would, get as many leaders on board with that ceos presidents <laughs> freaking prime ministers to just say i thought it was going to work i campaigned on this it doesn't work here's why i'm telling you that i, I made a mistake but this is my commitment to doing that all right so th that's what i would do yeah count me in yeah count me in, man. zoom i five yeah <laughs> but no thank you so much bro this has been so much fun i really enjoy uh the conversation yeah, vice versa. Thank you. This is like this has been the best hour I've spent all week. Yes! Give me another <laughs> give me another high five, man. Yeah, ah! <laughs> all right, Kings, Queens of Royalty. Until next time, use a difference to make a difference.